Black lives matter. White lives matter. Animals' lives matter. Plants' lives matter. Every life matters. Shouldn't be hard to understand. But then why is there so much hatred in the world <clears throat> that gives rise to racism, nationalism, that's often a, a cause, well, not really a cause, but that's with, linked with enmity and hatred, can be. <clears throat> there was a time when I was growing up in England, 1960s, 1970s, the idea there was still in the air was the idea that by progress, progress, everything's going to become better. And one of the things, the idea is that by mass education, people are going to become better. Why, why do people behave in a brutal, brutish, homo brutus, homo brutus, or... Not, why, why do they don't like, why do they not act like homo sapiens? Sapien, the idea gives it's supposed to be intelligent, and act like homo brutus, act like animals, because they're not educated. That idea was there, but we've, it hasn't happened. Mass education has not brought people to a better level of culture, <clears throat> a better level of civilization, a better level of behavior, and even some highly educated intellectual people, they can have absolutely horrible perspectives. And an example of that is uh, Martin Heidegger, who if anyone studies philosophy, they must have heard the name. He is one of the prominent philosophical figures of the 20th century, very influential, <coughs> German, Nazi, and rabidly anti-Jewish. It's, it's there in his writings. He has so many philosophical writings. But in his writing, right in a most horrible way against Jews, which doesn't seem to tally with intellectualism surely by intellectualism we should be we should have a better outlook on life than hating people because they're born in a certain race what's the problem that that I want to address in this talk for those of you who are kind enough to listen <clears throat> What is the problem? Is it a cultural problem? What is it? Uh, as I said, I was born, raised in, in England, and there was a culture of aggression, uh, agro was a word used by the skinheads, looking for some agro. Culture of aggression, uh, not that everyone was beating each other up all the time, although it did happen at the school I went to. It was not uncommon for, for fights to break out. <clears throat> but even in the language we use and the, the concepts that we have, <clears throat> I was saying about nationalism. So, well, I've grown up in England, so I... It's not that it was taught in the school, but it's just there in the culture. And I, I had the idea that Scottish people are very mean. That's, that was this stereotype of Scottish people. When I went to Scotland, I found it wasn't true. Irish people are all stupid. Well... Uh, my mother was Irish, and I didn't like to think of myself as stupid, but that was the 
That was the stereotype given. And, well, it was, I, I said, it's not exactly we were taught that, but in one sense we were, because in the history class, it was, uh, I, I, in, the his, in the history class, I learned the word jingoism, which means some kind of ribald nationalism without any intelligent basis. But actually the history course was like that because we, we learned to uh, think that the British leaders, I was going to say English, the British leaders, we, we learned about Gladstone and Disraeli and you might have heard their names. They were two rival prime ministers at different times of the United Kingdom. And we, we used to hear how and Lord Wellesley and Pitt, Pitt the Elder, Pitt the Younger, uh, before them. We used to, uh, yeah, and then, then the, the, the Napoleonic Wars, and we'd, he, we learned about uh, the wars and with, with France, and then we, we learned that Britain was always good and France was always bad. It wasn't stated like that, but the idea was there in the whole way it was presented. And we had names the, for the French. They were, we called them frogs, although I'd never seen or met a French person at that time. Uh, we called them frogs because we learned they liked to eat les cargo, which means snails. Mm. And no, well, that's frog's legs, isn't it? That's different. <laughs> we, we learned all these things. We, of all the things we could have learned about French people, we learned that they like to eat snails and frog's legs. <clears throat> well, we enjoyed eating their camembert cheese <clears throat> and brie cheese. <clears throat> so the Italians were wops, greasy wops. The Germans were Jerry's, and the, the Japanese were Nips, and we had comics, little magazines, and uh, in which they'd show, among other things, how the, the valiant British killing all the Germans in, in, with some kind of humor thrown in, and, and, and Japanese. And, uh, one. I remember seeing on TV Marty Feldman, who himself was Jewish, by the way, but uh, some absolutely racist humor about Chinese. And it showed some cartoon saying there's one Chinese born every minute or every two seconds, and it showed a, a, some cartoon of a Chinese-looking fat woman getting pregnant and a Chinese, a Chinaman popping out of her belly every two seconds. It's just absolutely racist. Uh, things have changed, thankfully. But I'm, I'm just saying the, ki the kind of culture we live in, and it, to, to some extent it hasn't changed. It, 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 what am I saying? Racism, uh, hatred, because it's easy it, uh, there was no actual hatred. Uh, oh, oh, another thing was Pakis, right? Pakis. Anyone of, from Pakistan or India, or we didn't know the difference. We, we called them Pakis. And then the skinheads, they went Paki bashing. And what else is there? Oh, so many things. Uh, Noddy, the Noddy books, I think by Enid Blyton, in which they showed black people and they called them gollywogs, by which in America, if, you, if the pejorative, one of the pejorative terms for Negroes, blacks, black American blacks, whatever you want to call them, is African Americans is nigger. And more common in England was wog, which was a sh shortened version of gollywog. So uh, th these were the book, these were the books that we were among the books at that time that we, uh, we learn to read with, and we imbibe the culture with it. So then it, it, it's, it doesn't go, it, it's, it, it's not far to go from denigrating people by calling them names by which we, we think we're superior to them. 
we're British, we're superior. Doesn't go long for, far from there to uh, as and when needed to whip up the people to hate them, make wars against them. So uh, thankfully there's, there have been moves, you know, action to try to stop this uh, racism in Britain. Noddy books are no longer allowed. <clears throat> but th there seems to be an inherent aggression and almost like a need to hate others. And a, a very good example of that, and a very prominent example of that, is football. So much, a, so much central to British culture and that of a lot of the world. <clears throat> Maybe even more, so, I, th I think more so than cricket in India even. Uh, I, I really knew the coronavirus it was really a big thing. It was really, uh, imp really impacting when I heard that in Britain the football games had all been cancelled. And wow, that's really, that's really something. Now, okay, you have... 11 people on one side, 11 on the other, and a referee if it's a... Uh, yeah, most games have referees, unless it's really informal. And uh, you kick the ball around, okay. But then uh, rivalry between clubs, so that the, the supporters of one club, they hate everything to do with the other club. And there's so many rivalries. There's, what is there? Liverpool versus Everton, Liverpool versus Manchester United, Manchester United versus Arsenal, Arsenal versus Tottenham, Newcastle versus Sunderland. These are the big teams. And, it, it, and the fans hate each other. <clears throat> in Scotland, Celtic versus Rangers. And even in, even in small clubs that you never... Hardly anyone's even heard of them, if they're local. It's what it is, it's mostly local, just like if you have two clubs in the same city, Sheffield Wednesday and Sheffield United. Yes, I still remember. Bristol City and Bristol Rovers. <laughs> then they hate each other. <laughs> because they're somehow or other, because they're close to each other, they don't like each other. And they don't they 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 have a feeling of hatred. And uh, then there's violence. When the, f when the clubs clash, they come together, they fight each other. And usually it's understood it, it doesn't go too far. They don't kill each other, although sometimes that has happened also. And then violence, the, fa the, f the fans of one club they, they, they go on a special train from their city to another city and in, on the way or on the way back they smash up the train. Hooliganism. <clears throat> Does it make any sense? These are all educated people, uh, at least they went to school. <laughs> uh, and it's going on to the present day. It, it's, there's been the efforts to subdue it, to, to control it but it's going on to the present day. <clears throat> so it, it, it's a violent culture and, oh, the, 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 in, in inherent, some inherent hatred. I'll, I'll give some examples from my life, my, my youthful life, which I'm so glad I, I was able to come out of this and come to what I'm now doing. Okay, some examples. I was, uh, I'm from the London area, so as a kid I was once in Chesterfield, which is a, some town in the north of England, north, northeast Midlands. And uh, I, wanted, I was, wanted to get back to uh, London, the area I came from. I was going to hitchhike, but I needed to take a bus from the city centre to the motorway. So, so I, I went to the bus stand and I asked in, I got into a bus which was nearly full, but the driver hadn't come yet. So I asked, 
Uh, does this bus go to the motorway or something like that? And the, the response I got, one woman said, Londoner. As a, uh, what, with, with a tone of great disdain. And, and what had I done to her? I was just asking, does this bus go to, and, and just, just some hatred? Not even. Okay, another incident. In Scotland, I was in Scotland. Um, I arrived in Glasgow for the first time by bus. Went to the toilet in the bus, bus terminal. And there was an alcoholic there, which not unusual in Scotland. Whiskey, he had a whiskey bottle, but he couldn't open it because the, it's one of those metal tops where you open it and it's supposed to pull it off, but if you don't, if it doesn't come off properly, it'll just go round and round and round. So he said to me, can I use your knife? I couldn't follow what he was saying because he's, was, his accent was difficult for me to understand. And then, uh, but then he asked me again, and I said, well, I don't have a knife. And he said, look, I just want to use it to get, he showed the bottle, I want to get the bottle. So he, di he didn't believe that I didn't have a knife. And he thought I didn't want to give it to him because I might use it on him. He might use it on me. And he was showing, you see, I'm, I'm just going to take the top of my... And he didn't believe that I didn't have a knife because it was supposed that every youth of my age, I must have been about 14 or 15 in Glasgow, at that time, it has changed, had a knife. What kind of knife? A knife for street fighting. Violent city. At the time. Ah. Then I was staying in a village not far from Glasgow. I was just staying there for some days. And uh, coming back at night from another village, uh, I got, somehow I got separated from the one. And then there was, a, there was the boys from the village, from that village, I got, they, they, they spotted me and they understood I, I wasn't a local person. I said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to that village. I said the name. And immediately they beat me up because I was, I was associated with that village. So in some ingrained violence in the culture for no reason. Well, it's useful, I guess. The uh, Britain became great by sending the Tommies all over the world. Tommy means the uh, foot sort, the, the common soldier who they had that culture of violence in them and if it's if it's channeled toward cultural uh sorry colonial conquest then it that's useful i guess if you want to make a british empire and that is that is machiavellian politics that how does the ruler keep people under control in his state? If you you always have to have an outside enemy, and because if you don't, they'll they'll come. The the people will rise against you. That's the idea. So, true or false, you have to keep people in fear of an external enemy, and then they direct their their rancor and their hatred towards the external enemy and then they don't bother you. That's the idea. Oh, what else? Mods and rockers. You can look it up on Wikipedia, I'm sure. It's there. Then the, later on there were skinheads, and what is it? Skinheads and greasers. And different gangs of people that form all over the country and they had their own style of dressing, their own style of haircut, their own style of uh, music, and they fought with each other. What for? What for? That's the question, isn't it? There is a Black Lives Matter. Why? Why is this going on? It doesn't make any sense. There's something seriously wrong. 
Can't we get along? Can we get along? Can we get along? Can we get along? Rodney King. Famous words of Rodney King, 1991 in Los Angeles. A black man. He was apprehended by white police officers for running away in, or running away in his car when they wanted to arrest him for drunken driving and then resisting arrest. And they, they savagely... Uh, got their batons and beat him. And it was filmed. This is in the days before people had, everyone was walking around with a camera, but someone happened to be there. With, and it was filmed and it went on TV and it went, it, it became a big thing. That how could, how, what is this? These police, white policemen beating a black man. Uh, <clears throat> although actually he was, resisting arrest. And that came up in the court case. The, the next year, the, the, uh, the court largely acquitted the police officers, saying that anyway this Rodney King was, uh, was resisting arrest and the police were within their, their rights, within their boundaries, to do what they did, although they said some of them went. But, so anyway, when acquittal was given, then uh, Los Angeles erupted in violence because the black people, they, they had so many issues anyway, and this, this was too much for them. That's what they felt. And then Los Angeles erupted in violence. Uh, Black people rose up, rioting, looting. Uh, it went on for how long? I, got, I looked it up on Wikipedia, and it took. Uh, it went on for six days, and sixty-three people were killed in that time. Not all blacks. And in the middle of that, after about two days, Rodney King came on TV and made a short speech. The, the words became famous. Can we get along? Although in popular law, L-O-R-E, it's become, can't we just all get along? Can't we all just get along? So Rodney King stood in as a, uh, he wanted peace. And he is, can't we just all get along? And then what's the problem? What is the problem actually? Why, why should someone hate someone else or feel antipathy toward them just because of the color of their skin. Well, no amount of sermonizing about this is going to change things. If we look at history, then we find, if we go back, I was saying yesterday, the Greeks are supposed to be the the beginning of the Western civilization. Well, when we say the Greeks, what do we mean? Now, nowadays, if we talk of Greece, then we think of a small country in the southeast of Europe. But it, it wasn't like that. There, there, were, there were small nation states who were often fighting with each other and fighting with each other and uh, fighting. Uh, there were fights with the Persians and and fighting is has been going on humans killing humans being inhuman since time immemorial in the in the New Testament we find the story of Jesus talking about the good Samaritan because it was it seems that it was presumed by the people he was ministering to, that every Samaritan must be bad. And probably the Samaritans at that time, people from Samaria, they thought that every Jew is bad. And this, the world's going on like that. You can have peace conferences and United Nations. Doesn't seem to make much difference. Communism, that seems, that seems, that should work, right? But it, 
the every the idea everyone's equal but it didn't work Re repeatedly all over the world it was found that it was maintained by violence by suppressing the people it didn't work <clears throat> it's it's a failed ideology it seems that it should work but that's a bit much to get into now but it's on a false on a false premise that everyone is equal but then just to give one example you have to have prisons because people are going to be criminals however much you tell them be good some people are not going to be good and then you have to have judges and then the judges have to have special protection which means they they're they're on a different level they have privileges which other people don't have. And they say it's a, a one-class society, but there has to be a manager class, and there has to be a worker class, and if the workers don't work, then there has to be some kind of pressure applied on them. It seems violence is necessary in human... seems it's necessary at some level in human society. Uh, so what's the solution? Are, are, are we doomed to live... Uh, worse than animals thinking ourselves civilized is there no solution what is the problem okay let's let's start to think about that or, are we, or do we just reject it are we inherently bad is it hopeless why don't we just uh, give in to our into to our nature just like sigmund freud suggested that or taught that we have so many psychological problems due to sexual inhibition. So we need to uh, free ourselves from sexual inhibitions, indulge in those, indulge in what we want. So should we do that? Uh, our aggressive nature, should we just indulge in that? Make war, not love. <laughs> is, that, is that the actual fate of the human race? What is it that makes us so bad? Huh? Can't we rise with reason? If, if, if we just get together and talk and say, uh, okay, how about this, how about that? Okay, let's adjust. If we meet others, uh, then We'll find out maybe they're not so bad after all. Or maybe they are. There are plenty of sociopaths in the world. Not uh, too many. One is too many. Hmm. We don't know how bad we could be. While we're thinking we're very good. I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't kill a black person. Well, I, I surely hope. I never do. Uh, I not hope, but we should be... We should have the conviction we won't do, but in uh, the 1920s in Germany, there were so many uh, normal, decent, hardworking people who in the next decade became Nazis and supported a, a doctrine which led to the Second World War. It was a war of aggression on the idea that the Germans are the superior race and that we should just take over other people's countries. For We need Lebensraum, living space. We don't have enough space. And uh, Jews, homosexuals, uh, people of low IQ, they should be s suppressed and killed. So it, was a, it wasn't that it wasn't that there were just a few people who somehow or other took charge. But you can see it's well known. You can see films of huge rallies of thousands of people, ordinary, decent people who had were fully subscribed to a horrible ideology that led to the uh, horrors of the Second World War and the horrors of 
Auschwitz and the other uh, death camps. Actually, Auschwitz wasn't a death camp. Anyway, uh, so uh, what is it? What is it? Or for that matter, what is it about human beings today who are ordinary, decent folk who think there's nothing wrong with torturing and killing animals en masse? Well, peace conferences aren't going to work. Education, at least the way the education system is going on now, that doesn't seem to work. What are we going to do? Let's, let's look at this in little depth. Depth psychology. How deep do we want to go? There's, there's the conscious, the subconscious, the subliminal psychology analyzes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's so many different schools of psychology. <clears throat> what is it that makes us so bad? Hmm. Actually, in Bhagavad Gita, we find Arjuna himself, who was a noble fighter. He, f he fought, but only for good causes. Sometimes fighting is necessary. For instance, if there is some gang of people, who, uh, some gang comes up and they start terrorizing people, then we'd be very, uh, we'd be, we'd call the police and the police would, uh, if required, which probably would be, they'd have to suppress that, that gang by force. Violence, righteous violence is sometimes needed to s suppress unrighteous violence. So Arjuna was a righteous fighter. But he didn't ever want to do anything, or anything wrong. He didn't want to overstep his bounds. He, he, he would kill if required, but he didn't want to do anything even slightly wrong. So he asked Krishna, Atakena prayukta yang papam charity purushaha anichanapi varshnaya baladiva niyojita. Arjuna asked the very pertinent question. Why is it that sometimes we do wrong things even though we don't want to? And it's almost as if we're forced to do so. Krishna replies, Kama esha, krodha esha, rajoguna samudbhavaha, mahashana mahapapma, vidhyenam iha vairinam. Krishna said, it is due to desire, material desire, I want this deeply ingrained sense, I want, <clears throat> which manifests also as anger or hatred. I want something, you're trying to stop me. I want something you've got, you've got something, you're superior to me, I can't tolerate that. So from this comes, that, that's called envy, someone's superior. We can't tolerate it. So all of it comes from material desire, Krishna explains. Uh, uh, and uh, this, Krishna says, it's like a fire which burns in our heart. And this is our real enemy. The real enemy is, is not the, the, the other football team. The, other en the enemy is not the, not the <clears throat> uh, some other race of people. We have seen the enemy and he is within. We ourselves are our own worst enemies. <clears throat> why? 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 Still doesn't say why. Well, a major, major, major point that the, the civilization pretty much everywhere misses is that we are not this body anyway. This body is only temporary. I, you, we're all eternal, spiritual living beings. Reincarnation is a fact. So I, I, I'm not actually this body or the mind that goes with the, the mentality that goes with this body. I identify with it, but it's not really me. In other words, what we perceived to be our existence. I am British. I am male. 
I am superior, or maybe we think I am inferior, but I'd like to be superior. Uh, this is my country. This has no real meaning, but we identify with the body and then we want to enjoy through the body. We, th we have the idea, I should enjoy. I should enjoy this world, which means if I have to cut down trees or cut down people, yeah, okay. And we may modify that to say, no, no, we should all live very peacefully and nicely together. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but uh, inherently we have this spirit of in enjoyment. So uh, it's, uh, on the one hand, with we may have a level of higher consciousness in which we think, yes, <clears throat> we should all be good and fair. But on the other hand, we have this spirit within us that we want to enjoy. So we want to, we want to enjoy the resources of this world at the expense of others, if required. The communism idea is that we share everything out. Mm. But it didn't work. It doesn't work. You may say, well, we could try again, but uh, how are we going to make it work? And what about the animals? We, we're, we're fair to the humans, but we kill the animals. How are we going to work this all out? So it's a really depth problem, and it's, this is depth psychology. There is a term, depth psychology. But how they, they think you go into the, the depths of the consciousness but consciousness is dependent upon the existence of the soul or atma. This we don't know. So we, don't, we can't go very deep if we don't know what's the source of consciousness. As long as the soul is within the body, it, we say it's a living body. And then we, we identify, this, these are my friends, these are my enemies. <coughs> And then we go to another body. When, when the soul leaves the body, we say, dead. He's died. He's gone away. Who died? Same body is there. Well, it's not moving now. Why isn't it moving? It's the same chemicals. Same structure. And why do we say he's gone away? Who went away? The same body's there. The soul has gone away. It's understood in every culture in the world. When someone dies, they say in their own language, gone away. Gone away. Chalega in Hindi. Chalega, chalegeti, chalegete in Bengali. In every culture of the world. So we, we get different bodies and different mindsets according to actions in previous lives. It's a continuum. And how we act in this life and the kind of thoughts that we nurture within our minds that leads to another body. So in this way there's a continuum from body to body to body. It's a perpetuating cycle. And in each body we get, we like people or dislike people according to how we perceive they will facilitate our supposed enjoyment of this world or obstruct that. In other words, we see as a friend someone who helps me to enjoy myself, live comfortably or whatever. And this way we've, we've formed societies, communities, nations, and then we oppose other societies, communities and nations. But it all comes down to how we want to enjoy ourselves. So our whole concept of enjoyment is skewed. There, there are some philosophical systems, notably Buddhism, which says that, which uh, will just stop all enjoyment and finish. <laughs> but as living spiritual beings, we have the nature to enjoy. But our concept of enjoyment is skewed, it's messed up. Mm. Getting deeply to the root of the problem. What, what is the inherent, the deepest desire that we have, everyone has? That desire is to love. We have forgotten how to love. Really. 
we are meant for love, but in material existence, we don't know what love is. We, we, we love our family members for what they provide for us. That may be not true in all cases. I, we talk of a mother's love. The mother's love is supposed to be the most pure, although nowadays mothers wantonly kill their children in the womb, in abortion. But the mother's love is supposed to be the purest, unconditional. Well, that's hardwired for the continuation of the race, but that's also of the but but that's all the, that's also not unmotivated. The mother gets gets pleasure in thinking this is my child. We hope she gets pleasure. But uh, <clears throat> that's also an illusion to think this is my child. It came from my body. But it, the body, either your body or the body you gave birth to, is a combination of chemicals. So it's a misplaced love. And for the sake of loving your child, you may mistreat another child. You, you privilege your own child above others. I love India, someone may say. And, and to love India, you should hate Pakistan, is it? Or to love Pakistan, you should hate India. What happens is, if someone say they're an Indian and they're fixated in hatred of Pakistan, then very likely in the next life they're going to get born in Pakistan because that's what they're thinking about. That's how the laws of karma work. And then you get born in Pakistan and you're thinking, I hate India. The whole thing's ridiculous. We transfer our, our love and hate. We, we bring that love and hate from one body to another and we just transfer the objects of love and hate. But the same propensity goes on and entangles us in material existence more and more. We are meant to love, but we don't know. Love is meant for God, who is the source or, and the object of love. He's the proper object of love. He's the most lovable. I, I grew up with a concept of God as being someone who seemed to be more of a uh, hating others than loving them because I was told that God creates all these living beings and throws most of them into hell forever with no hope of redemption. God is an angry old man. Well, I'm very happy that I've now heard about God the lovable, God the beautiful, God the sweet. He can also be terrible. <laughs> but by his intrinsic nature is lovable. And if we direct our love towards him, then we can love all beings because Krishna loves, but he doesn't hate. His love is not based on exploitation or, or uh, trying to uh, love others, trying to love and hate others. Krishna's not like that. If we love Krishna, we don't hate others. And we, we're also fully satisfied in our heart. And then we, we don't feel any need to have enmity toward others or hate others. There's no room. If our heart is full of love, then there's no room for hate. Now, I'm not saying I'm on that level, but I, I can definitely see it. And this should be shared. This should be shared with others. The prospect of living our lives not for money, not for prestige, not for hating others, and, and, and not for uh, not in ignorance, that thinking that this life is all in all and I'll die and then it's all finished, living in knowledge of reality. Uh, beyond birth and death. Because if we love Krishna, then there's no reason to be in this material world. We're in this material world. Icha dvesha, sumutena, dvandvamohena bharata, sarvabhutani sammoham, sarge yanti parantapa. 
Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, which he, out of his love, he gave us, that every living being is born in this world because of desire and hatred. It perpetuates life after life. But if we become free from this selfish desire, and we don't have any hatred, then we have no reason to be in this world, and we'll be with Krishna eternally in the spiritual world, the spiritual land of love, with Krishna, the supreme lovable person, and all his loving associates. Now, you can say this is some sectarian belief, if you like. You can reject it like that. It's up to you. But if it makes any sense to you, then you can try and find out more. You don't have to jump into it. Love can be very dangerous. You jump in and you don't know what you're getting into. But if you think there's any merit in this, what I've been saying, and what I'm saying it's not just something I dreamed up out of my mind. This is uh, the ancient process of bhakti yoga, the yoga of love, linking with God and linking with everyone by love. So if you think there's any merit in that, uh, please have a look at this book. It, it's uh, translated from the Sanskrit, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which means, is, is roughly, it's difficult to translate exactly, but it means the, uh, the, the ocean of the nectar of loving exchanges with Krishna, the supreme lovable person. So that's translated in English as the nectar of devotion by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. I'm just going to read a little um, from the preface to give some idea what's it all about. What is the solution to the problem of Black Lives Matter and the solution to every problem? Here, I'll just read a little. The basic principle of the living condition is that we have a general propensity to love someone. No one can live without living someone else. This propensity is present in every living being. Even an animal like a tiger has this loving propensity, at least in the dormant stage, and it is certainly present in the human beings. The missing point, however, is where to repose our love so that everyone can become happy. At the present moment, the human society teaches one to love his country or family or his personal self, but there is no information where to repose the loving propensity so that everyone can become happy. That missing point is Krishna, and the nectar of devotion teaches us how to stimulate our original love for Krishna and how to be situated in that position where we can enjoy our blissful life. In the primary stage, a child loves his parents, then his brothers and sisters, and he, as he daily grows up, he begins to love his family, society, community, country, nation, or even the whole human society. But the loving propensity is not satisfied even by loving all human society, that loving propensity remains imperfectly fulfilled until we know who is the Supreme Beloved. Our love can be fully satisfied only when it is reposed in Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare.